So welcome today to our Invasive Invertebrates in Florida presentation. This is our eighth session in our Invasive Species series. And I am Dr. Catherine Clements. I'm the Ecology and Natural Resources Educator here at University of Florida IFAS Extension in Sarasota County. And we started this series a little over a year ago, and it started out with only being a couple episodes, and now we're up to eight episodes, because unfortunately there's just so many different invasive species to discuss. So we're happy to have you here with us today. These um, webinars are also posted on our YouTube channel and will be on an upcoming webpage devoted um, just to invasive species information. Uh, so as I mentioned, I'm the Ecology and Natural Resources Educator here. I spent a lot of my time as a youth and young adult out in nature and environmental education was my first profession. Um, and then I spent a few years as a physician and then about five years ago came back to environmental education and took the position here at our extension office in Sarasota County. Uh, so that's a little bit about my background. And then our guest speaker today uh, is Carol Wyatt Evans. She was born and raised in California and has always had a passion for environmental awareness. Carol received her Bachelor's of Science in Aquatic Biology from UC Santa Barbara with a research focus on Antarctic krill. She moved to Florida in 2003 and transitioned to um, studying and working with terrestrial invertebrates studying insects relevant to agriculture, urban, and ornamental landscapes. Her passion for insects and environmental stewardship came together in 2016 when she joined us here at the Extension as the Chemicals in the Environment Agent. And her program focuses on chemical education, insects, and urban and landscape pest management. Uh, so you will get to hear from Carol after I do about a 10 minute introduction about invasive species and then she will go into specific invasive invertebrates today. Uh, so a little bit about extension in case you're not familiar with us, we are a partnership between Sarasota County, the University of Florida and the USDA. And in fact, every county in the state of Florida has an extension office associated with it because as part of the land grant university um, agreement, all of our states that have land grant universities have extension offices in their counties. And really our mission is to use that university research and the resources to provide solutions and opportunities for our individual counties. And so each extension office is a little bit different because we are focused on the needs of our specific county. We provide practical education to help our residents, professionals, and the decision makers to build a better future for Sarasota County. And here at our office, we have a really large extension office with a lot of different specialty areas that you see here on your screen. So we have programming and education in all of these areas. We have lots of different classes, both in-person and virtual, most of them being free of cost. So please, uh, please take a look at all of our offerings because I'm sure you'll find many things that you're interested in. And then these are just a few of the logos of some of the programs that we offer here. Uh, for instance, in the upper right-hand corner, uh, the Florida Master Naturals program is one that I'm quite involved in, and that's an adult education program through the University of Florida that's taught across the state about Florida's ecosystem. So if you're interested in all things Florida and natural, uh, those are great classes to partake in. The Master Gardeners are a huge program here. They provide hundreds, probably thousands of hours of volunteer support to our community in the area of just how do you garden in this crazy state of Florida? Um, and lots of other programs uh, that we offer here. So today we're gonna talk a little bit about the terminology and definitions around invasive species. We're gonna talk about the impacts that invasive species have and why should we even care about them. Uh, we are then going to cover invasive invertebrates, not natural area plants. And we will also talk about what you can do to assist with all of this. So let's jump right into definitions. 
So, um, and if you've been to some of the other sessions of this of these webinars, uh, some of these slides are repeats. We do an overview at the beginning of every um, session of invasive species. So these are gonna be a little bit of a repeat for you if you've joined us before. So when we use the word native species, we're referring to a species that occurs naturally in a specified geographic area, meaning it's probably been here for hundreds of years. And generally how we talk about that here in Florida is that it was here uh, pre-European um, population coming to the state. So uh, if there are records of it being a species that was here prior to about the 1700s, then we consider that a species that is native to Florida. Whereas a non-native species is one that does not naturally occur occur in that specified geographic area and was somehow brought here and introduced. So an introduced species is a species brought to a new geographic area, either intentionally or unintentionally by humans. Um, so and Carol and I will talk a little bit more about that, but sometimes things are just unintentionally introduced because they come from um, another area on a plant or in our suitcases and we didn't realize it or like on our clothing when we've gone and traveled and then brought like a seed that is stuck to us back to a new area. So sometimes that introduction is unintentional but still can be an issue. And then established species are species which have a self-sustaining and reproducing population. Um, and they're doing that without the need for human intervention. So in order for a species to become invasive, it clearly is going to have to be self-sustaining and reproducing uh, because it, you're going to see in a minute the terminology or definition for an invasive species is one that, uh, that is causing economic or environmental harm or harm to human health. And in order for it to do that, it needs to be reproducing on its own. Um, but also native species can, are, can be considered established and usually are as well. Um, so established just means that they're self-sustaining on their own through reproduction. So here's our terminology for invasive species. And there's really three parts that make a species invasive. So it's not just that a species is not native to a geographic area, because sometimes, especially here in Florida, we have plenty of species that weren't here for hundreds of years, they've somehow been brought to our state, but they aren't causing a problem. So if they aren't causing a problem and they're non-native, then they aren't considered invasive. Um, so an invasive species is non-native, it has been introduced by humans, but it is also causing environmental or economic harm or harm to human health. And so you will definitely see that explained throughout Carol's presentation about some of these invertebrates. And then a nuisance species, and usually we refer to um, plants using this terminology and uh, sometimes in terms of animals, but it's more in terms of plants. A nuisance is an individual or group of individuals of a species that is causing issues with overgrowth, it may be causing property damage, and this can apply to both native and non-native species. So when I think about a native species that's a nuisance species here in Florida, I often think about grapevine because grapevine does belong here. It's been here for hundreds of years, probably thousands of years. So it is a native plant, but it sometimes can be very aggressive in its growing characteristics and it can cover over um, smaller plants, shrubs, and trees, and potentially shade out their ability to photosynthesize. So that becomes a nuisance. And then the last term I want to share is range change. This is the circumstance of a species current range shifting over time. And this can happen due to some sort of natural occurrence, like perhaps there was a weather event that moved the species without assistance from humans perhaps because of climate change and the range is changing because of that. And some of the examples I think of with this is armadillos and uh, coyotes. So both of those species were not considered native to Florida, but now they are all throughout Florida. And it's because, for instance, with the coyotes, red wolves were extirpated from Florida, meaning they they were killed and they no longer occur in Florida and they were holding that ecological niche 
so that coyotes couldn't move into Florida. And once the red wolves were removed from Florida, then coyotes moved in on their own without human assistance. So that's what range change is. All right, so I'm gonna share a little bit more information with you and a few quotes. Um, so this is a quote from the USDA, a non-native plant that does not need human help to reproduce and maintain itself over time in an area where it is not native. That's what we call a naturalized plant, but it also refers to animals or could refer to invertebrates. And um, so even though their offspring reproduce and spread naturally without human help, naturalized plants do not over time become native. So, um, you know, native really refers to a species that's been here for hundreds of years. And then the University of Florida worked with a number of professors and extension agents and um, published a document, I believe in 2020, about all of this terminology that I just shared with you. And really what they were trying to do was to create sort of standard definitions for these different terms, because the terms you see up on your screen were also being utilized and different agencies were utilizing different terms. And it was starting to get confusing. And also some of these terms are just not really considered acceptable. Um, so instead of using words like alien species, foreign, introduced, non-indigenous or exotic species, we really want to be very clear about what we're speaking about. And we're using more um, just staying along the terms of native, non-native or invasive for the ones that are non-native and causing uh, harm to the ecosystem or the economy. And just a reminder that not all non-native plants or animals or invertebrates actually become invasive. Some might have, um, have the potential to become invasive and they may be on a watch list that we're paying attention to, or some non-native plants or animals or invertebrates may just be coexisting with our ecosystem. And yes, they don't really um, belong here historically, but they also aren't causing a problem here. So it's good to be clear about how, how we're utilizing those terms. So some of the impacts that invasive species have um, 85% of non-native species in the United States come through the Port of Miami, um, more specifically in terms of plants, because there is a huge, um, a huge influx of plant species through that port. And when, throughout the state of Florida, we actually have some of the largest ports in our entire country. And so whether we're talking about the aquarium, landscape, nursery, florist, or pet trade, um, a lot of those things are coming in through Florida into the rest of our country. And insects are great at hitchhiking. So once again, we may unintentionally introduce some invertebrates um, through some of these other, uh, these other trades, like they're hitchhiking on plants, for instance. Um, also, some of species can come in the ballast waters of ships. Uh, which are sometimes then released in the new port where they might be releasing the water and some things have hitchhiked in that water as well. Uh, things can hitchhike on wood pallets and in packing material. They can be transported by machinery, cars, or boats like we see here with um, all of the hydrilla wrapped around this boat motor. And now if somebody takes this boat without cleaning, into another um, water body, they may be introducing that hydrilla, which has been one of the most expensive invasive species efforts in our state. And then of course, travelers sometimes bring home souvenirs too and don't realize that they may be causing problems by doing that. And non-natives love Florida. So uh, we have a wonderful climate, which is why so many of us humans move to Florida. Uh, but also many of the plants, animals, and invertebrates that are brought into Florida can exist here and sometimes exist exponentially well here. And that's due to our tropical and subtropical climate. We also have vast agricultural holdings in the state and sometimes the uh, uh, the disturbance of the land in, during the process of agriculture is a perfect place for especially some of the invasive plants to take hold. We also have a large um, amount of out-of-state landowners or seasonal population that may either bring things down here because they want 
their yard to look like it did somewhere else in the country and not realize that that's not going to work or may actually be a problem here in Florida. Um, or they may not be taking care of their land throughout the year because they aren't here all year round. So there's a number of ways that seasonal or out-of-state population can um, sort of exacerbate the problem of invasive species. And here in Sarasota County, we have an increasing wildland urban interface, meaning where our wild lands come up against our residential lands, there's just a lot more of that happening as more people continue to move here and our population continues to develop and expand towards our natural areas. And that wildland urban interface is often a place where we see invasive species being able to thrive or being able to jump from a residential space into more of a wild natural space. So um, Carol's going to talk to you about a lot of the invertebrate species and some of their strategies, but invasive species have a lot of different strategies that allow them to become invasive. So uh, for instance, if you think about some of the plants, they may grow really quickly, much faster than some of our native plant species. Um, whether we're talking plants or animals, our invasive species often have lots of generations. And in each of those generations, when they reproduce, they often have a high number of offspring. So they're able to not only grow quickly, but they're able to reproduce quickly as well. And then maybe many of our invasive species have behavioral plasticity, meaning they can tolerate a wide range of conditions, which allows them to survive sometimes even better than our native species. And also what we often see is that when a species is brought here, it does not have its native predator or its native disease that helps keep that species population in check. And that's another reason why um, it can overcome our native species by just rapidly growing in population. So the National Park Service uh, put out this quote, invasive non-native organisms are one of the greatest threats to the natural ecosystems of the United States and are destroying America's natural history and identity. These unwelcome plants, insects, and other organisms are disrupting the ecology of natural ecosystems displacing native plant and animal species and degrading our nation's unique and diverse biological resources. So often we get a question about, well, why is this such a problem and why can't we just let these species live? And, you know, a plant's a plant and it's providing oxygen. Um, and some of that, you know, I, I can see some of that argument, but also the bigger argument is, is that these invasive species are changing ecosystems. And so although they are not a problem where they are natively from, and so they should be obviously allowed to exist where in the areas where they're native, when they are introduced to other areas in the world, they are actually displacing our biodiversity. And that's, that's gonna be an issue because biodiversity is linked to human health. And so as we lose our biodiversity, we're actually impacting human health as well. So to start to wrap it up, some of the dangers of this issue with invasive species, besides what I just mentioned, is that they often outcompete the native species. So sometimes they're either overgrowing, outbreeding, or even eating the native species. Um, and this may push threatened species to extinction. And in fact, um, about 42% of the species that are on the endangered and threatened species list are directly impacted by invasive species. Uh, also, some of the invasive species may increase wildfire risk and fire fuel when we're talking about plants. Um, also, some of the plants are unstable in our tropical weather events here. And across the board, plants or animals, invasive species are difficult and expensive to control. So I think this is my, potentially my last slide, um, but this is a, an invasion curve and it's just a graphical representation of this issue. And so if you look down here in your bottom left-hand corner of the graph, this is when a species has not been introduced into its non-native area. And so at this point on the graph, you're at a stage of prevention where 
perhaps you're making sure that a certain plant, animal, insect doesn't come into a certain geographical area. And I think Carol's got a couple examples of that today. Um, then as we move along the graph, at this point, this is where the invasive species enters into the area. And we transition into what's called eradication, where we are trying to eradicate that species from that specific geographical area because it is causing economic or environmental or harm to human health. And this is when you have small numbers of localized populations and you may still be able to get boots on the ground and actually do what needs to be done to eradicate it from the area. Once you move into containment and asset-based protection though, this is when the species population and the geographic area it is covered is expanding to the point where we're beyond being able to eradicate it. And as we continue along this curve on this graph, our expenses, our resources needed to manage that invasive species all escalate. So um, for instance, Brazilian pepper tree, um, which is uh, a tree or shrub that you can see all throughout Sarasota County, unfortunately, is not native to this area. It's considered an invasive species. It's actually a prohibited species. So it's illegal to plant it or even to cut pieces of it and transport it because it is so damaging to our native ecosystems. And we spend hundreds of thousands of dollars trying to manage that plant now and especially try to keep it out of our natural areas to preserve some of that natural and native biodiversity. So we really wanna be learning about invasive species and trying to prevent or eradicate them so that we don't get into these areas and issues with containment and asset-based protection. All right, so I think I just have one or two more and then Carol's gonna to talk to you about all sorts of cool bugs. Um, so these are just some organizations or agencies where you can find more information about some of the things that Carol's gonna to talk to you about today. And then I'm going to turn it over to Carol Wyatt Evans. So Carol, take it away and I'll stop sharing so that you can share. Great. Thank you so much. That was fabulous, Catherine. Okay, great. Well, thank you all so much. Um, you know, any day I get to talk about, about uh, insects is a great day for me, even if they are invasive insects. Um, I still get to do some education on them. So um, what we're going to start with, um, so globally, talking about insects facing several major threats. So as Catherine said, you know, Florida, we're, we're, we live in a pretty amazing state. We have a subtropical climate with plenty of sunshine and warm temperatures, limited cool temperatures, um, makes living here pretty darn amazing for us, for wildlife and for invertebrates. We know that insects are facing several major threats globally. Um, those are the same threats that affect our own native species here in Florida. The first one being um, introduction of invasive species. So invasive species can displace indigenous species and modify ecosystems, making them unsustainable for our, our native populations. Um, invasive insects are often much less visible than invasive, invasive vertebrates or animals, but their effects can be just as significant. The second major threat is uh, habitat destruction through fragmentation of land, uh, land transformation, whether that's for agriculture, for um, like you know, flood protection, which we know that's happening at the moment, development of industries, or even our um, housing, right, and our urbanization. In farming, those uh, natural areas are destroyed and then pesticides are applied to the crops and you know, ends up making them unsustainable for insect survival. And then in urban landscapes, our mowed lawns, right, our meticulously mowed lawns, um, limited landscape diversity, um, neither of those are conducive for the continued existence of most insects. There are a few that do really well under those conditions, um, but we always call those pest insects, right? And then in forest ecosystems, um, as tim timbers harvested or forests are burned to create grazing lands, um, numerous host species are, host-specific insect species disappear, um, which in turn then are a detrimental rippling effect within that food chain. And then the loss of just one insect species is never limited to just one species. And it's difficult to know and understand that impact from the loss of that species until it really is too late. 
Then here in Florida, um, for example, the Florida scrub is a local habitat, um, easily recognized by the dominance of like evergreen shrubs, uh, frequent patches of the, that bare white sand that we have here in Florida. And it's long been a real desirable land feature for development and ag. So in the early 1980s, an estimated of like 66% of scrub habitat was lost just in the Lake Wales Ridge alone. The devastating part of that is that there are more than two dozen threatened and endangered species dependent on the scrub and the entire community is itself endangered. Unusual vertebrates uh, found in the scrub, including things like Florida scrub jay, as well as the Florida mouse, um, those are both endemic to our state. And about 46 species of insects and spiders are believed to be restricted just to the scrub. And that includes 20 species restricted to the scrub within the South Florida ecosystem. So that just shows you, you know, what a devastating effect, um, you know, both invasive species as well as like habitat destruction can have on our, our native population. So we, um, Catherine covered this a little bit, um, but how invasive species, species find their way into the state is actually not really surprising. Um, we're surrounded on three sides by water. Um, we have 15 deep water seaports, which handle over 107 million tons of cargo. Um, we have 12 international airports. We're close to our southern neighbors, which contain some of the richest ecosystems for species diversity. With all of that, it's no doubt that there are many insects that are gonna make their way into our state. Many are stopped at the border by state inspectors, but there are by far not enough agents to inspect every cargo container. So many insects go unnoticed and undetected. Invasive species can spread to new areas through unintentional introduction. You know, we've, we've mentioned that over again, um, but invasive species are primarily spread by us, by human activities. People and the goods we, we use um, travel around the world really quickly and they're often carried um, as uninvited species with them. So we carry uninvited species with us. Um, ships, ships carry uh, aquatic organisms in their ballast water. Smaller boats carry them on their propellers. No, we've covered that. Insects can get into wood. Um, this is a big way for, especially for wood boring beetles, um, but they get into the wood, into shipping pallets, um, hand crates that are shipped around the world. Some ornamental plants escape um, in the wild and become invasive, and then some invasive species are in intentionally or accidentally released. Now, back to that first major threat we talked about um, to native species. So the influx of, influx of invasive species. When we look at the statistics from our regulatory agency, the USDA APHIS, um, the insect species that are most commonly introduced are hemipterans. So these are the pest insects that can really wreak havoc on our agriculture crops as well as our landscape plants. So we know these as our scales, mealybugs, aphids, and whitefly. Um, but as you notice there, um, fruit flies and weevils actually rank number two and three as the total number of inceptions. And as you see on the table, um, there were all these inceptions were on personal baggage. So not only cargo ships at port set of bringing in these non-invasive species, but us on plant material, mud on our shoes, but especially food, um, all carried on our persons. So we have a responsibility to make sure that we are not the one transporting um, these unwanted pests into our state. And I say this, um, I realize we have somebody from um, Hawaii on our, on, our, uh, on our presentation today, so welcome. So I've broken down this presentation into three different parts. So I'm gonna talk about um, invertebrates that have been here and um, are now throughout the state. In some cases, they're actually well beyond our, our Florida border. Inverts that are fairly new to the area and then inverts that have not made it into Florida, but can be organisms of concern if they do find their way into our state. So here we go. So the first insect that we'll cover is um, been established in Florida, and it's the red bay ambrosia beetle. Beetles are in the order Coleoptera, and the red bay ambrosia beetle is part of the, uh, I always, I'm horrible on Latin names, Cuculonidae, the snout and bark beetles. The red bay ambrosia beetle is native to Japan, Myanmar, uh, Myanmar and Taiwan. It was first found in Florida in 2002 around uh, Northern Duval County, but since then it's become established throughout Florida as well as in the Southeast US basically over the last decade. 
and it most likely arrived on imported wood, wood packing materials. As I said, um, wood boring beetles are notorious for coming in on these uh, wood pallets. When we think of beetles, we tend to think of these big, robust insects, right? Like June beetles or even rhinoceros beetles, right? They're big and they're visible. Well, when you look at a red bay ambrosia beetle, they're small, they're elongate, they're fungus farming beetles. The adult is only about two millimeters in length, so it is tiny. This is just one of many forest pests that are moved to uninfested forests by human uh, moving firewood. So here's my first PSA, <laughs> help to protect our forests. Do not move firewood. So unlike most wood boring beetles, the red bay ambrosia beetle actually attacks healthy trees, but it also attacks weakened trees. What happens is it attacks the trees in the Lauraceae family, so our true laurels, um, as well as their closest relatives, and they vector a, leaf, a lethal fungus to the native trees in uh, Southern Florida, such as like Red Bay and Swamp Bay, and are also very important commercial avocado. So, you know, we talk about commercial avocado, but this also means trouble for our backyard avocado trees as well. Avocados account for approximately 6,600 acres in the Miami-Dade County, and they have an economic impact of about $54 million to the region's economy. So the avocado industry has already lost over 120,000 trees uh, due to the laurel wilt since 2011 when it was first showed up in Miami-Dade County. Um, the most noticeable sign of, of beetle infestations are these pitch tubes. They're created by the burrowing insects. So they look like small stir sticks or like, uh, you know, toothpicks that protrude from the trunk of the tree. Um, there also may be sawdust evident at the base of the tree. So here, as you can see, are, are these, these pitch tubes. But even if they lack pitch tubes, doesn't mean that it's not infested. Um, it's not the beetle itself, but it's the fungus that they farm that causes laurel wilt disease. It infects the xylem. What happens is it blocks off the vac vascular system and it causes wilting and, and eventual mortality in the tree. This fungus has decimated bay trees to such an extent here in Florida that they are only now rarely found in our natural areas. You can identify an infection by staining from the fungus that's just below the bark. So if you're able to peel off that bark, you see this, you see this, these long staining, but um, it appears as like these dark streaks that run parallel through the trunk. And the fungus is actually cultured within the wood for the larval food. So the beetle has a really interesting relationship with the fungus. The adult carries the fungus from tree to tree in these special, specialized structures on the, on the insect called uh, mycongeas. Um, after it burrows into the tree, what it does, it deposits that fungus into, that, into its gallery. The beetle then lays an egg in that larval stage. Will, when it hatches out, it feeds on the fungus until it reaches the adult stage, where then it then you know, collects that fungus and goes out and starts that cycle all over again. So symptoms of the disease usually develop within four to eight weeks of infection, um, but it, vary, it varies depending on the host species. Uh, plants with laurel wilt have leaf drop. Um, so first they get really droopy, leaves turn reddish or purplish, and eventually they turn brown and then die. However, red bay leaves, they change colors and they can actually stay attached to the branches for, you know, for a year or even longer. At first, you may only see symptoms in a portion of the crown, but gradually that entire crown becomes discolored and, and will, and will uh, wilt. So within that time from infection to the tree mortality, ranging from four to eight weeks, in order to prevent spread of the disease, it's really important that the tree be destroyed as soon as possible. Now we get a lot of kickback here when we have to bring this up to people, but it's really important to understand why you have to destroy that. The only way to manage laurel wilt disease and keep it from spreading is by suppressing that pathogen, right, the fungus and its vector, the ambrosia beetle. The reason for having to destroy the tree is due to the fact that the largest portion of the ambrosia beetle population is actually found inside that infested tree, making other treatments extremely difficult as a curative treatment. So removing the tree includes things like removing the entire tree above and below ground and destroying it by chipping and or burning it. 
If the wood chips are, are not burned, they should be sprayed twice with an insecticide. And this is gonna eliminate the beetles inside that tree stump and wood and stop them from reproducing. Trees that are in severe decline, regardless of the cause, should also be removed and destroyed immediately to stop beetle reproduction in the wood and remove that likely source of future ambrosia beetle reproduction. Now you say, you know, if it's not caused by the beetle, why would you do that? Well, stress trees produce ethanol, which the beetles then pick up on and flock to that source. So as they attack the tree, that tree produces even more ethanol, bringing in more beetles. So any trees in that adjacent area are prone to attack by the beetle. So contact insecticides have not been shown to be preventive of the ambrosia beetle emergence from already infested uh, trees or wood. And only a few contact insecticides have been found to prove good control of ambrosia beetles on wind surfaces. So really good management practices which maintain the health of the tree and reduce that tree stress is going to be the key to avoiding that beetle infestation. Okay, our next insect. So Africanized honeybees. So um, they've been in Florida for quite some time. Um, honeybees, so um, apis species, they were brought to the U.S. in around 1600 by the European settlers, and they soon became one of the most economically beneficial insects. The aphis honeybees are gentle in nature, and um, that really makes them really, you know, really easy to manage. All honeybees are subspecies of the western honeybee, aphis mellifera. Um, this originated through Europe and Africa. So the Africanized bees were brought to Brazil in the African bees were brought to Brazil in the 1950s by researchers in an attempt to create this bee hybrid that was better suited to tropical conditions. Also, they thought that they would produce more, more honey. Um, although they expected that African honeybee to lose that like more defensive nature when they mated with European uh, bees, uh, that wasn't the case. So in 1957, um, queen bees escaped from breeding programs and a large wild population quickly developed and spread through South America, Central America, and Mexico. And then in the 1990s, the Africanized honeybees were identified in Texas and they've since spread throughout the Southwestern US and the Southeastern. So Florida had its first positive identification of, a, of an Africanized honeybee colony in Tampa Bay around 2002. So when you're looking at um, the, the uh, distribution, that I-4 corridor seems to be kind of that boundary line for Africanized honeybees. Central Florida sits right on that main uh, battle line and the majority of feral colonies will most likely be Africanized. Anything north of the I-4 corridor are gonna be feral, feral European honeybee colonies. But trying to differentiate between European honeybees and Africanized honeybees is uh, very much not an easy task. Africanized bees are slightly smaller than those domestic bees, but it takes literally going into a laboratory test to measure that difference. It is so minute. However, their behaviors and their characteristics give more indicators of which honeybee is present. Is present sorry. <clears throat> so a single African bee sting is no more venomous than a single European bee sting, but Africanized honeybees are more defensive. They defend their nests with less provocation in much greater numbers and for longer distances, earning that nickname of the killer bees. Africanized honeybees produce more offspring and they swarm as many as 16 times per year, where the European honeybees only swarm once, maybe twice a year. Swarming is that uh, reproductive behavior that occurs when bees, they're, they're looking for a new nest site. <clears throat> so Africanized honeybees are, are not selective in nesting, nesting sites. They're going to quickly occupy empty spaces, whether it's holes and cavities, um, you know, smaller areas. Um, their swarm is typically the size of a softball. So they're quite uh, small in comparison, comparison to our, our European honeybees. And African honeybees, they tolerate real small areas. So things like kestrel night nest boxes, buckets, um, they can use smaller voids. But what happens is they use those smaller areas so they fill up faster, so they swarm more. That's why it you know, ends up to be in those, those uh, you know, very large numbers of swarms per year. 
European honeybees are more selective in their nest sites. They prefer drier sites, um, usually three or four feet above the ground. They're also more likely, uh, Africanized honeybees are more likely to abandon their nest when they, they're threatened by predators or um, you know, different uh, uh, environmental conditions. So finally, um, they also do not store large amounts of food like the European honeybees. <clears throat> but swarm management becomes very important and a proven way to minimize invasions of Africanized honeybees. So managed hives are actually the first and their best defense um, against an area becoming Africanized. So managed uh, hives, they dilute the, the African honeybee populations and they prevent those African honeybees from taking over of the European honeybee hives. Managed hives uh, compete with feral colonies for resources. And the Africanized, Africanized honeybees are less attracted to areas where there are other foragers. Um, so they have fewer foraging areas. So given their nature of swarming, to collect the colonies, the bee swarm traps are uh, put out. So if you look at that bottom right picture, so this is a bee swarm trap. Um, these are, these are uh, swarm traps or they're small. They're really like two pieces of, of cardboard sort of um, put together. They're easy to move and they're really cost effective. And these are often uh, proactively placed around existing apiaries uh, to collect feral swarms before they can then go in and infest the uh, the European, European honey beehives. So this is just a picture. Could you imagine being confronted with this when you're opening your barbecue to start grilling your hamburgers? Well, I guess it is better than like first turning on the heat, right? And then realizing there's an infestation. But uh, this is just to show you that they're really opportunistic and not really picky in the location that they choose to settle their colonies. So, <clears throat> this graphic shows the difference between the Africanized honeybee and the European honeybee in pursuit of an invader. So the Africanized honeybee will pursue an invader with 10 times more bees and will stay in pursuit for 10 times farther, right? So they are persistent. So if you look at the two pictures on the left, um, you can see that the bee markings on, uh, bees mark their target with an alarm pheromone. And the one that gets marked is the one that is attacked over and over and over again, um, basically re you know, relentlessly. So in these pictures, the person being mobbed uh, most likely didn't wash their bee suit and still has alarm pheromone on it. So here's this, this person here is right here. So you see how many bees are on them. So the good news is that Africanized honeybee, uh, their defense has become less severe over the last 15 years that they've been in Florida. So I guess if there is a, you know, <laughs> if there is a ray of sunshine in that, that's one of them. Um, safety tips to remember when you are around suspected Africanized honeybees. Well, the first thing is to try and eliminate potential nesting sites around your, around your yard or your house. Check your walls, eaves, uh, plug holes before they find the area and they start to establish. And um, before you use any sort of power equipment like lawnmowers, chainsaws, weed eaters, look for bee and bee activity because that noise is really disturbing um, to the bees and will get them in flight and start to defend. If bees begin to chase you, run away in a straight line covering your face, particularly your, your nose and your mouth, and get inside a building or a vehicle. So even if a bees, you know, or a few bees get in there with you, it's better to be inside in an area away from the greater number of bees and have just those few in there. Again, they are, their sting is no more powerful than a, than a normal honeybee. They can only sting once because once they sting, that stinger uh, is removed from their abdomen and it, they end up dying. So you will only get stung once by that bee. So um, residents can help in Africanized honeybee management by reporting any feral colonies on their property and having them removed. So I won't get into it, but I get a lot of people who say they want to keep their colonies that have shown up, but the potential of them being an Africanized honeybee is greater and uh, you know can be more detrimental than than actually destroy having that um, that beehive uh, destroyed or that bee colony destroyed. So moving on, so the insect we love to hate and for a good reason, the mosquito. So Aedes aegypti, the yellow fever mosquito. Um, has been a nuisance species here in, in the United States actually for centuries. 
It originated in Africa and was most likely brought in the New World on ships used for European exploration. We really should be concerned about mosquitoes. Mosquitoes are the number one deadliest animal in the world. They kill more than 750,000 people yearly through vectored borne diseases, but they also cause massive illness in millions and millions of more people than they kill. Aedes aegypti is the primary vector of yellow fever. It's a disease that's prevalent in the tropical, uh, south, tropics of South America and Africa, and it often emerges in temperate regions during summer months. During the Spanish-American War, U.S. troops actually suffered more casualties from yellow fever transmitted by this Aedes aegypti mosquito than from the war itself. <clears throat> Besides yellow fever virus, um, Aedes aegypti actually spreads dengue fever, chikungunya, and Zika fever, as well as a few other diseases. Um, there is a vaccine for yellow fever, but it's the only uh, vectored virus that has a vaccine to it. There are no other human vaccines. There are some for our equine species, right, for our horses, but there are none for people. But thanks to the vaccine, yellow fever is actually caught, the yellow fever is rare in the U.S., but uh, most recently, the, uh, the disease to be concerned about in the Florida is the transmission of dengue fever or dengue virus. Dengue is also known as the break bone fever, and this is due to the excruciating pain caused by the virus. So both yellow fever and dengue are caused by a, a flavivirus, which attacks the liver, but it can only be transmitted by a female mosquito. So with increasing temperatures for longer periods of time, um, the threat of mosquito vector disease is going to increase uh, and you know, stay on the rise. So we really need to start being really vigilant and cognizant of, of you know, and our awareness of mosquitoes. But you can identify an Aedes aegypti by the white markings across its leg, and as well as the markings in the form of a lyra on the upper uh, surface of its thorax. So this has a lyra shape, and um, it's you know, its relative is the um, Aedes albopictus. They're very similar looking, uh, but the albopictus actually has just one straight, really thick white line across the, the uh, um, dorsal side of its, its thorax. All mosquitoes require water to complete their life cycle and understanding their life cycle or their life stages will go a long way in their management um, of this insect. So they go through what's complete metamorphosis, just means that they have four distinct life stages. So they have the egg, the larvae, the pupa, and the adult. The adult female um, takes a blood meal to develop her eggs, so only the female bites. And then um, when she lays her eggs, they're dark brown or black, and they're laid individually right above waterline. The female can actually lay anywhere from 100 to 200 eggs per batch, and she can lay up to five batches in her short lifetime of just three weeks. So what happens is when that water rises, it touches the, the base of that egg and it triggers them to hatch out. So these larva stage, they're also called wigglers. They're gonna go through four aquatic feeding stages. So that's where they require full water. So um, aquatic feeding stages that then transition to a non-feeding pupil form. So as we see here, here we have our eggs, there's gonna be four of these larval stages as they get bigger, right? They're an insect, they have to grow, they molt. They go into this pupil form, um, which actually is still a mobile form, but it is, but it's uh, non-feeding. And then that female emerges, but it stays in this pupil stage for about two days. And then um, the adult emerges. This entire process can take as little as eight days, sometimes even a little bit less. So that's when we're saying that knowing, understanding that life stage is really important to being able to um, monitor and um, control this insect. So Aedes aegypti are pests, um, they're aggressive biters, um, they target your ankles and your elbows, and they're out during the day when we are out during the day, or when we are active. Um, they're very weak flyers and they stay within a third of a mile, so that's 500 feet from where they emerged. Um, so they also find their way inside our home. So these are one of those mosquitoes that's gonna be inside your home, um, which makes them even extra you know, annoying. But again, it's only the female that takes the blood meal. With the adult, the adults, the both the male and female actually feed on nectar um, for their food source, right? So they can actually be considered minor pollinators. 
Aedes aegypti is a container in uh, a, a container mosquito. So this is where we come into it. Um, they breed in standing water in flower pots, spare tires, drainage ditches, in the creases of tarps that cover your boat, um, water holding plants, as well as clogged rain gutters. So basically they're gonna be anywhere that there's standing water. We really call these backyard mosquitoes. They thrive in urbanized areas and in close contact with people. So this makes them exceptionally successful vectors, right? Because they're in close contact with us. So again, if it, you know, if it wasn't for, the, for us and our habits, um, these mosquitoes would not even be a problem in our urban environment. So management strategies are quite effective and they're easy if they're applied on a consistent basis. Um, they include things like pour out any standing water on a weekly basis. I do this, I walk around my house at least once a week and I'm pouring out any water from, whether it's from irrigation or from, from rain. Um, repair rips or, or tears in your screen on your lanai and your windows, right? That's gonna stop them from coming in the house. Clean out gutters of leaves, debris, uh, debris um, and make sure that water is flowing through those gutters like it should be. Um, scrub your, if you have a bird bath, scrub your bird beds, baths and change that water weekly. Um, use biological controls such as gambusia fish, right? These are great little um, um, native species of fish that are top feeders and they munch down on mosquito larvae because um, those, those mosquito larvae if you look here, um, this is those, those four you know, wiggler stages. They have a siphon. They actually have to breathe water. They don't have gills at this stage, they, or they don't have gills. They breathe water through this, this uh, air siphon, and so they stay at the top for the most time. And so gambusia fish are top feeders, and that's how they, they control those mosquito larvae. You know, a, a catfish is not going to be helpful in controlling, controlling mosquito larvae. But you can also use bioirrational products like uh, BTI, uh, Bacillus thuringiensis israeliensis. It's a specific uh, bioirrational, it's a microbial product, specifically for the control of uh, larval mosquitoes. So um, you apply this to, to water bodies, they eat it, and then it basically blows them up from the inside out. But to protect, you need to protect yourself as well um, from bites. So using an EPA registered insect repellent, I can get you a list of those, uh, you know, in an email if you'd like. Wearing long sleeved, light colored, light colored clothing, clothing when you're outside. Um, when you're sitting on a lanai, I'm running two fans. You know, we usually have one that's overhead, but run one at your feet towards your legs. Um, like I said, they're weak flower flyers, so that's going to keep them from being on you. And then burning citronella candles or using those plug-ins or vapor diffusers with citronella oil. Um, those are going to be great uh, repellents. Okay, on to our next one, the great old uh, red imported fire ant, uh, Solianopsis invicta. So I'm going to just say Riffa because it's a lot easier. <laughs> so Riffa is native to central uh, to to Central South America. It was introduced into the United States from Brazil, either at Mobile, Alabama, or in Pensacola, Florida, somewhere they think between 1933 and 1945. It most likely came into port um, in soil used in the ballast of, of cargo ships. So it has established here in the US and um, it it currently infests more than 367 million acres of land. Um, they have even be found, been found in the mountains of North Carolina. So fire ants are not only a pest of the US, but they have become a major issue, issue globally. Um, and this is due to their amazing ability to adapt to new environments and climates, as we see, you know, they're in the mountains of North Carolina. So, um, RIFA have an impact on agriculture and natural resources by damaging crops, agricultural equipment, as well as impacting wildlife. Um, they also cause uh, both medical and environmental harm, causing aller uh, allergic reactions, which includes anaphylactic shock um, in susceptible humans. So RIFA have done well in our urban environment since they prefer disturbed soils, um, which is really, really common in our urban landscapes. 
and there are plenty of available food sources for them in our urban landscape. One of them is uh, being their mutualistic relationship with pest aphids. So they'll actually, um, um, they actually farm aphids. They will, you know, they take care of the aphid um, by keeping them from being, being eaten by other predators, while the aphid will, uh, provides them with honeydew. It's a source of, of sugar. And the uh, ants will actually move the aphids around as the ants move. But refer are typically, um, as far as uh, trying to, uh, their characteristics, they're typically a dark red or brown with a black gaster, which is their abdomen. And then they have a stinger at the tip. Their pedicel, so this is their pedicel or waist, um, has two nodes. So here we have one and two. And they have a 10 segmented antennae, which ends in a two segmented club. In identification, when you're looking at that, that's really important. If you bring them into me, I'm gonna first thing you ask you if they have one or two nodes and that instantly will separate what ant you have, whether you have a big headed ant or you have a red imported fire ant. So although they're from South America, um, there are noticeable differences in colony structures of fire ant colonies here in the US and those in, in South America. So RIFA colonies here in the US all are what's called polygony, um, which means they have multiple queens. Um, workers are polymorphic. So that is that they consist of many different size ranges, anywhere from, from two and a half millimeters to six millimeters. So these are all worker ants, but they are uh, uh, polymorphic. So they are very different in size. Their lifespan varies between 30 to 180 days, but the queens can live up to six years. So a queen can produce anywhere from a, you know, 1,500 eggs a day, and a mature colony can have upwards to a quarter of a million ants in each colony. And then all the, the workers in a colony are actually sterile females. So the mating flights are their primary means of colony propagation, um, but they also use a thing called budding. So budding occurs when a, a portion of that colony be basically becomes an independent unit and they will have their own queens that go with them. So after one full year of a, a, being a colony, that colony produces reproductive alates. So these reproductive alates are just those winged ants that are the reproductive females and males. They have anywhere from six to eight mating flights a year, and they consist up to 4,500 alates at each of these uh, flights per colony. Um, and those are gonna happen in spring and in the fall. Mating occurs during the flight, and then that male um, soon dies right after they mate with females. So in the Southern US, um, as many as 97,000 queens can be produced per acre of infested land per year. So that, you know, as we talk about, you know, invasive species and how quick they, um, they build up those populations, that is, I mean, red ants are like probably the primary, um, you, know, uh, you know, example for, for what they can do and how destructive they can be. But the mated queen, um, back to the queen, the mated queen, she then burrows into the soil with, and within 24 hours, she starts laying eggs. She lays between 10 to 15 eggs. Um, these are gonna be the workers that, that then start and support that colony. Within six months, that colony is gonna have a few thousand uh, workers. And that's when we can start seeing those mounds uh, in either field or in our lawn. So their diet usually consists of dead animals, including insects, earthworms, and vertebrates. Um, but workers are also going to collect honeydew and forage for sweets and proteins and fats. Like I said, remember they they they're going to they farm aphids, so the aphids actually produce honeydew, which is basically just uh, insect sugar poop. So it uh, produces that sweet uh, for those those ants. When they come inside your house, sometimes you're gonna find them in piles of dirty laundry. So uh, the other thing about insects, uh, about the RIFA is that um, they sting. We all know that fire ants sting. Their sting actually contains an alkaloid venom and it's those alkaloids that are responsible for both that pain and that white pustule that appears about a day after you get, by, uh, you get stung by a fire ant. 
<clears throat> what they do is worker ants, actually, they're going to, um, they bite you first. So they, they gra grab a hold of your skin. So they bite you with their, their big, powerful mandibles, and then they will sting and they can do multiple stings uh, when they inject uh, that venom into you. Um, so it's just that sting, though, that is, is responsible for making that, that pustule and for the pain. So <clears throat> occurrences across the land. So in ag fields, uh, RIFA invades soybean crops and uh, heavy infestations can actually decrease uh, crop yields. They are also opportunistic feeders on young tender growth, but they occur throughout the year and they can cause significant damage to many different crops. You know, including our citrus, our corn, beans, peanuts, um, and cabbage, and quite a few others. But in the urban setting, uh, red, ant, red ants um, will nest under like patio slabs, in our lawns, under the edge of sidewalks, in our foundation, uh, you know, basically anywhere, including electrical boxes. So they often move to higher ground after heavy rains, so they have the potential at that point to, is when we find them coming into the house. RIFA prefer, prefer, excuse me, prefer warm, sunny areas of disturbed soil. So that's a key right there, warm, sunny areas of disturbed soil. Um, so they are really uh, quite prevalent in tilled, uh, tilled ag fields, as well as in our urban landscape, because we do a lot of, uh, right, a lot of uh, disturbing of our soils. They're less prevalent in natural areas that are under canopy, right? Because there's a lot of shade, but they are common along uh, like roadside right of ways, as well as dirt roads and along trails. They can have a huge impact on wildlife as well as uh, they can reduce populations of certain species. Uh, RIFA have been reported to reduce ground nesting populations of rodents and birds. In some instances, um, they may completely actually eliminate ground nesting species from an area. Because, uh, because there's this 20, you know, 10 to 20 year lap before uh, reductions in bird populations are observed, it's, their, their actual effect on, uh, you know, on our animal populations may be uh, gravely underestimated. And an example of their indirect effect on wildlife can be seen with like young fawns. So what happens is they can disturb a nesting fawn, right? A fawn that's hiding in the, in the grass, causing it to behave in ways that it would normally not, not be behaving. So it might be running, you know, jumping up, running around, maybe vocalizing. And this is gonna uh, make that fawn susceptible to uh, predation by, you know, uh, coyotes and, and wolves. So, um, you know, they do have an indirect effect on our wildlife as well. Have a huge negative impact on sea turtle nestings and, and nests and hatchlings. They can prey on unhatched eggs as well as they tunnel underneath uh, the uh, sea turtle nests and they actually monitor for their hatching. And as soon as they emerge, th those, uh, those uh, nestlings emerge from the egg, the fire ants will move in and, and, and prey on those hatchlings. There was a 2002 study on um, loggerhead sea turtle nests and there was a recorded 71% morta mortality in hatchlings due to fire ant predation. So uh, again, a huge, huge impact on our, on our uh, sea turtle population. And then the human toll from uh, RIFA from, the, from their stings is an important public health concern. So stings may produce a large range of reactions, both localized pain and swelling to anaphylactic shock, making it hard to estimate really the true cost um, to our, our public health system. So I, I talk about red ants a lot because they really are a, a, a huge nuisance, not nuisance, but a huge problem um, here in the States and globally. So for fire ant control, um, it can be challenging and difficult. Uh, their galleries actually go down to the water table. Uh, the mound that is on top is actually what is the, uh, the soil that they excavated from the bottom of those tunnels in those galleries. So that's what's sitting at the top. Chemical controls with sprays is actually the least effective treatment for fire ants since it only kills the foragers. And there's only about 20% of the foragers are out at at the mound at any one given time. Baiting is your best option for fire ants. And really it's a kind of a two-step process. So first, the best thing to do is twice a year, do a broadcast. And I'm one that I'm not for putting out 
chemicals. This is one chemical I say is a really good uh, preventative, uh, you know, and, and cultural practice. So a broadcast bait uh, twice a year to reduce those colonies. And you want to do it, especially during cool mornings or at dusk, right? So when it's cooler out. And then second, those individual nuisance mounds, treat individual mounds. Um, you're going to scatter bait around around the mound, never right on top of the mound, because they're foragers. They're going to go out. They want to look for it as they forage. So never put it right on top of the mound, because you're actually going to uh, you know, you're going to disturb that mound and you're more likely to make them move. Um, cultural controls are fabulous. Landscaping is one of the best way to, ways to minimize uh, uh, fire ants because a lot of that extra shade, they don't like to be in shaded areas, so it's going to reduce the number of, of ants. There are some biological controls that um, I, don't, I won't go into for the uh, sake of time, but um, there's a couple of parasitoid wasps. One, it's called um, the anticapitating wasp, um, which is actually right here on our, on our picture. Um, the wasp lays an egg inside the ant. It eats the ant from the inside out, and then it pupates in its head, and then it knocks its head off and, and uh, exits the head. So kind of a really, you know, thing that those... Uh, our alien movies are made out of, but so cool that that uh, the insect world does this. But there's also um, pyramid ants will will kill fire ants, so please don't kill all ants unless you know what they are. And then there's there's also a um, a uh, fungus that that will attack uh, fire ants. So there are quite a few controls. Okay, so on to the inver the invertebrates that are fairly new to Florida. So I'll try to speed this up a little bit. <laughs> so, so the Asian citrus psyllid. So this is a real tiny insect. It's in the order Hemitra, um, and it's an important pest of citrus in several, uh, uh, actually in several countries. Um, it's a vector of one of the most serious citrus plant diseases in the world. That's the greening disease or Hong Long Bing disease. It's also called yellow, uh, yellow dragon disease. Excuse me. Um, the <clears throat> this originated from Southeast Asia, where it's it's it is widely distributed in in uh, Southeast Asia. So this disease is responsible for the destruction of several citrus industries in Asia and Africa. And until recently, um, the Asian citrus psyllid did not occur in North America or Hawaii, but it was reported in Brazil. <clears throat> but then in June 1998. Um, the insect was detected on the east coast of Florida, um, all the way from Broward County uh, up to St. Lucie County. Huge citrus area, right? Huge citrus area. It was most likely introduced through illegal imported plant material, um, but by September of 2000, um, this pest had spread to over 31 of our Florida counties. So Asia citrus psyllid spread to Texas in 2001, then out to California, another huge citrus area, right? That was in 2008, and then in Arizona in 2009. So this is really spreading throughout, you know, throughout the nation. It's now present in all citrus growing regions of the United States, which is, you know, is just a, a horrible, I, you know, a horrible thing. Um, the Asia citrus psyllid is only um, one of the two psyllids that are known to vector this citrus uh, greening disease, and it's the only economically important psyllid species on citrus in the world. But the adults, um, again, really small. Remember, I we were talking about earlier how uh, invertebrates, insects tend to be small and they go undetected. Well, the adult is only about three to four millimeters long, and it has this, you know, it's actually a beautiful little insect, um, has a molted brown body and a light brown head. It's covered with this whitish waxy secretion, so it actually makes them look kind of dusty. It looks like they're covered in powder. And adults will leap when they're disturbed and they may fly a short distance, but they, they're one of these insects that actually likes to kind of stay in place. They're usually found in really large numbers on the lower sides, right, the underside of the leaves. And they, they rest in a head down, so their head down with their, the back end of them is, is raised at an angle. The adults are active when there is new growth on the citrus. So when that citrus flushes out is when uh, they're most susceptible to this, this uh, influx of this insect. Adults live for several months um, and the female can lay up to 800 eggs in, those, in, in that time period. 
There are anywhere from nine to 10 generations per year, but they have been recorded to be up to 16 generations in the in perfect environmental conditions, right? So this is the perfect storm where everything has to come into, in, into line, but up to 16 per year. So the insect itself, um, it doesn't really cause that much damage. So it's not the insect that causes the damage, but it's the bacteria that it, it transmits through its feeding behavior. So it's that hung lung being, and it can trans transmit, um, I'll call it HLB, uh, to uninfected citrus trees as it feeds, right? So it's kind of like mosquitoes where it picks it up from one and can transmit it to another. So the nymphs, um, are they stay completely exposed and they're always found on new growth. As you see here, here's a bunch of, of uh, nymphs here. Um, they move in a really slow, steady manner when they're disturbed. So, um, you know, just kind of methodical. And they produce that white waxy excretion as they feed. Um, so, you know, it looks like a little bit of a, a Christmas tree sort of. <clears throat> so, with citrus greening, um, once a tree is infected, there is no cure. So the disease is not a threat to humans or animals, but it has devastated millions of acres of citrus crops throughout the United States and abroad. And um, fruit from the trees, excuse me, fruit from the infected trees remains green even when it's ripe. And then it's also tends to be misshapen and it's bitter and it's unsuitable for sale as fresh fruit or for juice. And so we know, you know, citrus here in Florida, when that happens, um, you know, we're, we're going to see a lot of economical, economic harm done to our to our state. So the most infected trees have a short shortened lifespan, as well as they reduce that fruit quality, as well as the fruit yield. And then the tree actually dies within a few years. There are only a few ways to try and prevent the citrus screening. Um, and for us, this includes us buying it from, you know, a lot of us like to have citrus in our backyard, but only pr uh, purchase citrus plants from a certified vendor and make sure that it's accompanied by that USDA certificate. So the USDA will certify um, these uh, you know, uh, HLB free uh, plants. But when you're buying from a vendor, also ask if the product is in compliance. And then if you're in a quarantine area, so you can find these quarantine areas um, on the, the FDAX website. If you do have any fruit that comes off that tree, consume that, that fruit um, in that, you know, at your house and don't transport that, that fruit or that plant or plant material out of that quarantine area. That's really important. But what's pretty neat lately is that um, the USDA um, ARS has started training specialty dogs to detect, to, te to detect HLB and they have a 99% accuracy rate. So that's a really good, um, a, you know, a really good control uh, method that was coming up. So, you know, dogs are also good for detecting termites. So, um, you know, dogs are our friends in many ways. But really, the only way to curtail the spread of the disease is, is to eliminate um, diseased trees as quickly as possible to prevent further spreading of that disease. Now on to the lychee ear nose mite. So the lychee ear nose mite is not an insect, but it's an arthropod in the class Arachnidia, and it's in the family Urophidia. Again, I have horrible time with Latin names. Um, so the lychee nose mite is native to Asia. It's an incredibly tiny microscopic pest mite. And mites in this family are actually strange little creatures. Um, they only have four legs um, and that body is really like worm-like. So this is a, um, this is a, a picture of a, a lychee nose mite. Um, they are a specialized family and they actually are host specific and they can even be plant part specific and they actually cause very distinct damage. So um, this is, you know, when we see these pictures, like you see this, um, you know, this lychee tree, um, you can really tell that that's, that's a mite infested tree. But the lychee erinose mite is a pest of lychee fruit trees. It causes erinum, which is a gall. And what happens is they're hairy, abnormal growths that form on the leaves of the lychee tree. And what it does is that hairy growth actually protects the pest while it's feeding. It does prefer new growth on trees um, and dirt. It really likes being out during moderately hot and dry periods. It doesn't like really, really hot periods of time. 
The mite does not do well in high temperatures, in high humidity or high uh, heavy rainfall. It's moved by uh, drifting on air currents, but it also attaches to honeybees. That's how small it is. Um, it can be moved on infested plant material, but of course, uh, we also move it around unintentionally. The early stages of infestation are uh, white hairs. It starts out as white hairs on the underside of the leaf, and then that's followed by blistering on the top side of the young leaf. So here we have a picture of the, the hairs. And then, um, you know, on the four, previous picture, you can start seeing, like here, you can start seeing some blistering hair, but this is already a heavily in, infected tree. <clears throat> but the leaves then start to distort and curl, and then they finally get those large areas of heavy red masses on the underside of the leaf. So this is just, you know, if you see this, you know that's an infested tree. But if it's left unchecked, an infestation of mites can spread and severely damaging that tree as well as the fruit and the flowers on the tree. Um, FDAX has eradicated this, this pest twice before. So uh, the first was here in Sarasota County in 1957, and then again in Miami-Dade in 1993. So we've just in you know, 2018, we just had our, our third um, you know, prevalence of, of the uh, lychee ear nose mite, and they're still working to, uh, to eradicate that. So um, you should notify FDAX immediately if you spot an infestation, or a lychee tree that's displaying symptoms of the lychee ear nose mite, because they're gonna come out and they will, they will take care of that tree for you. UF does have some guidelines and recommendations for homeowners with lychee trees in their landscape. The first is called hat tracking. So this is really a complete removal of the stems and the foliage um, until the tree literally looks like a hat rack. Um, all that debris should be removed and bagged. Um, do not compost it. Um, treat the trees according to the recommendations with an Azdractin horticultural oil mix, and then treat both the affected trees and your surrounding trees. Um, you can you know, continue this treatment for seven day, uh, on a seven day interval. Um, and as the leaves begin to flush out, remember they like the, that new growth. So as they begin to flush out, uh, treat those new leaves as they appear. This is a great prevention mechanism and prevention is really the key yet once again to, to eradicating um, this lychee ear nose mite in the state. So onto our, our inverts that haven't quite made it to Florida yet and keep our fingers crossed that they never will. So <clears throat> the first to discuss is the spotted lantern fly. So although it's called a fly, and it looks like a moth. Um, the spotted lanternfly is actually an insect in the order Hemiptera. So it's in the family of plant hoppers. It's native to China and was found in the US and Pennsylvania in 2014. It's since been found in Delaware, uh, Maryland, New Jersey, and Virginia. So it is um, still fairly north of us, but um, you know, it's making its way, I have a, I have a feeling. So the adult is about one inch long and about a half inch wide. Um, they have these large and beautiful colorful wings. Uh, the four wings are that light brown with black spots as we see here. And um, they actually have that, they have speckled and a banding at, at the rear of, of the wings. And then their hind wings, which is this second pair, um, are a real deep scarlet with black spots. And <clears throat> at the front, and, and then white and black stripes at the rear. So, you know, incredibly um, beautiful little insect. Their abdomen is actually yellow with black bars. So um, yeah, they're like a little rainbow. Um, nymphs in their early stage of development are black with white spots and they turn to this red before they become adults. So um, egg masses are yellowish brown and most are covered with a gray waxy coating and they resemble basically a smear of mud. So here we see uh, these are a lot of uh, uh, spotted lantern fly, but um, you can sort of see some of these uh, egg masses are, are here. So the adult and the nymph feed on a wide range of uh, fruit, ornamental, and woody trees. So they have piercing sucking mouth parts, um, and so they suck the juices out of the plant. Signs and symptoms of these insects are uh, the plants that will start ooze or weep, and they have a kind of a fermented odor. Um, they can have a buildup of sticky fluid 
and that's honeydew. Remember, I talked about that insect poop, <laughs> so or that that sugary uh, insect uh, poop. So that's going to be on the plants, and then it can also be on the ground as well as underneath the infested plant. They might also have sooty mold um, associated with it. So um, that's really sooty molds are characteristic of uh, a piercing sucking insect because it sits on that honeydew. So that um, excrement, that's, uh, that that uh, sugar carbohydrate laden excrement it draws in that sooty mold. But spotted lantern flies are invasive and can be spread long distances by people who move infested material or items that contain those egg masses. They're, this is huge. They're freaky, frequently found on the sides of RVs and trailers and vehicles, and even clothing that um, maybe was hung out to dry, right? These lantern flies will take any opportunity to, you know, any place to lay eggs. The adults do not fly long distances and are um, considered when we say hitchhikers, right? So they don't like to fly. They want to be somewhere and have and be transported that way. If they're allowed to spread in the United States, this place can be a serious impact on um, our country's grapes, our orchids, our orchards, as well as our logging industries. So most states are considered at risk of invasion by this lanternfly due to this you know, really wide uh, host range of, 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 of theirs. So the next one is the emerald ash borer beetle. So this is another one of those invasive wood boring beetles. Um, the adult uh, emerald ash borers, they're beautiful. Um, they're uh, bright metallic green with this beautiful purple abdomen under their, their, their front wings. Um, but like most, um, they're only about a half inch long and about an eighth inch wide with this flattened head um, and, and their back. So as you can see here, you know, they have this real obvious flattened head to them. An adult uh, uh, emerald ash borer can fit um, basically on the head of a penny. So uh, <clears throat> they are in the Brupestid family, which is the metallic wood-borne beetles, and they're native to, to East Asia. And like their name implies, they feed specifically on ash trees. So the larvae are a cream color, excuse me, cream colored and warm-like, um, but they also have flattened heads and they're located just underneath the bark uh, in these serpentine galleries. So as you see here, um, these are these serpentine galleries. So emerald ash borers were first detected in the U.S. in, in 2002 in Detroit and most likely arrived on infested uh, solid wood packing materials from Asia. So <clears throat> the emerald ash borer has killed tens of millions of ash trees in the northern U.S. and it's a hitchhiker on firewood and infesting new areas at alarming rates. Right, it's been found to be as low as central Georgia and Alabama, so it is getting close to our Florida border. So the adult beetles are active in May and early June, but um, their expected activity in the southeast as it gets warmer would be kind of more early spring. The adults actually nibble on tree foliage, uh, but they cause little damage. Adults are short-lived. Um, they live only about three weeks and um, they're active on sunny and warm days. The larvae feed on that inner bark of ash trees and on the, the uh, tree phloem. So what they do is they disturb that tree's ability to transport that water um, and the nutrients throughout the tree. So that's really uh, the detriment to the tree. So both healthy and stressed trees are at risk of infestation. So again, you, know, you talk about you know, once they start feeding, those trees become stressed, they put out ethanol signals. So they're gonna bring in not only these tree, these uh, beetles, more beetles, they're gonna bring in different species of beetles as well. But infested trees initially show signs by uh, like thinning foliage throughout the canopy and then that canopy dieback. So woodpeckers, um, woodpecker damage is really common and may be actually your very first symptom of an early infestation of these beetles. The signal uh, signs of larval feeding is um, it starts to split the bark and then they get those serpentine uh, larval galleries and then they get D-shaped exit holes. Because of the size of their head or the shape of their head, those exit holes are D-shaped. Um, and then they also have extensive larval feeding damage can quickly lead to that tree decline and to death. Uh, the uh, 
emerald ash borer attacks only ash trees, but it shows a preference for the green and the black ash. And there are four species of ash trees in Florida, which primarily occur throughout the northern half of our state, which means that all Florida ash species are a potential host for the emerald ash borer. So please, again, another PSA, <laughs> the same one, please do your part and do not transport firewood from other states or out of an area where you're burning wood. Florida does have an active monitoring program in place uh, for this beetle. And if you think you've seen an emerald ash borer beetle or a diseased uh, ash tree, then contact uh, the uh, FDAX helpline, which is, which is the uh, number on the slide. Now the Asian gypsy moth. So this is a part of a, a grouping of moths that are in the, uh, the genus uh, Lumentria. So the Asian gypsy moths, are, they're exotic pests that have infested a few areas in the Northwest US, as well as North Carolina and West Virginia, but they were re eradicated in those, those areas successfully. They're quite similar to the European uh, gypsy moth uh, subspecies, which is really common throughout our state, and throughout the states, including Florida. So the adult females, they're creamy white with a wingspan of about nine centimeters. So they're actually pretty big moths. Adult males are, are a bit smaller. They have about a four centimeter wingspan, wingspan and they're also kind of a gray brown. The, the larvae of, of a moth is a caterpillar, right? Quite beautiful. Um, they vary in color, but they have these really long hairs that are covered that cover their body, and they have two rows of large blue and red spots on the on the dorsum. So here we go. Here's a here's a picture of one of their their uh, the larval caterpillars. The caterpillar is voracious. So it's a voracious pest of trees that uh, imposes a major threat to our our forest habitats in North America. So throughout North America. Adults do not feed, so they have one purpose and that's reproduction. So as soon as they uh, pupate out into the adult, um, the adults are no longer a problem except for the fact that they're gonna lay more eggs and um, create more caterpillars. So the egg masses are laid on tree trunks and covered by that yellow fuzz from the female's abdomen. And then each female can lay hundreds of eggs after a successful mating. So newly hatched uh, larvae, they're dispersed Each uh, caterpillar is capable of consuming about one square meter of foliage. So most feeding happens at night, and that's to protect the caterpillar from predators as well as their heat, uh, as well as heat. And then feeding damage results in like complete defoliation of a forest, right? If it's a heavy enough infestation, it can defoliate an entire forest or even just a section of forest. Um, horticultural and urban trees are also at risk of defoliation from this caterpillar. The, uh, the gypsy moth larvae have been known to feed on collectively on over 500 plant species covering over 100 botanical families. So again, another one with a really, really large uh, uh, plant species host range. The adult females are active flyers um, capable of flying um, up to 25 miles. The adult lives only for about three weeks, um, and again, only for reproduction, they don't feed. The males have even a shorter lifespan, and they die uh, very soon after mating. This uh, broad range of, of possible host plants, combined with that female's ability to fly you know, long distances, means that they can um, spread rapidly into, um, into and through uninfested areas. So you know, that's one of the, the biggest issues with, with this particular insect. And then large infestations can completely defoliate trees, weakening the trees and leaving them more susceptible to other diseases. So close attention should be paid to transporting this gypsy moth on vehicles and plant materials and shipping materials. I know, are you getting tired of hearing that yet? <laughs> Now, that's really common with all of these species. So if you think you've found a moth, again, contact that FDAX hot, uh, hotline. You can also contact the USDA or even go to your local extension office um, for assistance with this moth. But there are several biological controls for these to uh, 
that have been proven effective against the gypsy, gypsy moth. But again, contact a state agency or extension office before you actually want to take any actions. It's really important to make sure that you have that you are uh, IDing that that moth. Now our final one is the Asian giant hornet also called the murder hornet. We get a lot of questions about these, so that's why I wanted to end with this one. So the Asian giant hornet uh, is a social wasp uh, in the species of uh, Vespidae, in the family Vespidae. Its native range extends from Northern Ar India to East Asia, and it's frequently called the murder hornet, although we never really like to use those kind of words. It's called the murder hornet because it's earned that nickname from the way it hunts down and kills honeybee colonies. The Asian giant hornet is the world's largest hornet, measuring up to two inches long. It is massive. Um, the markings on the head are a solid yellow or orange, and it has um, solid black eyes. The thorax, so here we have this yellow head, and then the thorax is mostly a solid dark brown or black, uh, making a real striking contrast with that head. And this is a really good identifier for this, this particular uh, wasp. And then the abdomen has alternating bands of uh, dark brown or black and yellow and orange. I know this kind of describes just about every wasp that we see, right? Reports of the giant hornet in Florida are often uh, cases of misidentification since they resemble native hornets and wasp species here in Florida. But despite its large size and just those distinctive markings, people often confuse it for many other species, even those that are half the size of, of the, this uh, particular uh, hornet. They create new hives each year with a single queen. Uh, they normally feed on insects and sap and soft uh, fruit, but they seek out high protein foods when they're feeding, uh, when, when feeding when they're going through their reproductive stages. So this is uh, when the males and females that will be, uh, they're, they're creating the males and females for that following year's queens. So this is when they attack those honeybee hives for that protein content. So what they do, the honeybees, uh, the hornets go in um, and then they're going to kill all of those adult bees and they leave them laying at the bottom of the hive. And then what they do is they remove all the brood. They take the larvae and the pupa back to their own nest and then they feed those to their to their colony. But they also, you know, they attack, uh, you know, we, we talk about the beehives because they're such an important beneficial pollinator for us, but they do attack many other social bees and wasps as well. The Asian giant hornet can travel up to 60 miles in a single day, and it can fly at speeds up to 25 miles an hour. So they're big and they're fast. So this is just a, a picture uh, or a slide to give you what, um, you know, things that we get them mixed up with, so lookalikes. So here in, in Florida, we have the Eastern Cicada Killer. Um, it's found here in Florida in the east and in the Midwest, but it can be up to two uh, inches, uh, long as well. It has a much smaller head in proportion to the body, um, but it has a reddish th thorax instead of that black. So um, here we have the Asian giant hornet, 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 and here we have the Eastern Cicada Killer. Um, the bald-faced hornet, this next one, um, this is found throughout much of North America, but it's common in the southeastern U.S much smaller, much, much smaller. Um, it's usually, usually about a, a three-fourths of an inch long, um, but they're usually slightly larger than yellow jackets, um, and they are mostly have a black abdomen with white markings. And then they tend to get confused with a lot of our uh, paper wasp species. Um, again, paper wasps are, are found throughout North America. They can grow to about three quarters of an inch long, and they're significantly smaller than the Asian giant hornet. But these are just those that we know are here in Florida and just a few example species. Um, these are just a few additional pictures of the Florida cicada killer, just for reference. They are quite large, but they're still not quite as large as the Asian giant hornet, and the markings are quite different. So, um, yeah, here we go. Um, so the Asian giant hornet and people, they do not normally attack people or pets unless they feel threatened. Uh, their stinger is longer than those of bees or wasps um, and their ven venom is more toxic. Um, and as a hornet, 
They can sting repeatedly. And like a bee, right? Um, these guys can sting us over and over again. So if um, you're ever around one and you're allergic to bees um, or wasps, be extra vigilant if you're around uh, this particular species. This pest first uh, reported in the Vancouver um, Island area of Canada in about 2019. And it's since been detected in the far north uh, corner of Washington state. It's adapted to live in low elevations, forested, wet and moist areas. And as we've already discussed, it's not in Florida and with good monitoring programs in place, which we have, hopefully it will remain uh, confined to that uh, Pacific Northwest and the uh, Canada, uh, Canada regions. Okay, that's the last of our, of our insects or our, our inverts. But um, just a couple more slides, more slides for me, management of um, invasives. So how you can help. We have a huge impact on the movement of invasive species in our state. So we should be very vigilant and remembering, do not pack a pest. So this includes don't carry fruits or vegetables into the state that may be infested. Be careful when moving uh, plant material around. Buy and burn local firewood, right? Don't carry firewood in or out. If you see an insect that you don't recognize, contact your local extension office or your regulatory um, agency to make sure you get a proper identification. And don't apply chemical treatments unless you have a proper identification of that insect. Um, indiscriminate use of pesticides um, is a, a recipe for disaster. So what's all the fuss? So as we've gone through this series, we've learned how serious an issue of invasive species are. They can cause extinction, extinction of native animals and plants. They reduce biodiversity through feeding and lack of natural controls. They compete with our natural species for resources, including food and shelter. And they alter habitats to the point that they become depleted of the resources and the structure required by, you know, in order to sustain those, those native species. And although insects are much smaller and more difficult to identify as pests, they are just as destructive and detrimental to the natural ecosystem as are invasive vertebrates or plants. So remember, don't pack a pest and we will all be better off with everyone's help in keeping invasive species out of our state. And with that, I will turn it back over to Catherine. All right, thank you so much, Carol, for telling us about all things creepy, crawly, and concerning in the invertebrate world. Um, so SISMA stands for Cooperative Invasive Species Management Areas. Uh, so these are regional um, groups that work on invasive species in their area, um, whether that's doing education for the general public or doing work days or just um, sharing information in between agencies to better help develop solutions for our invasive species issues. Uh, that is what your SISMAs do. If you are here in Sarasota, Manatee, Pinellas, or Hillsborough County, you are part of the Sunco SISMA, of which I am the co-chair currently. And so please feel free to reach out to us or to go to the website listed there to find out any more information. There is a National Invasive Species Awareness Week. It usually occurs towards the end of February every year. And we are planning on having uh, sort of a, a regional uh, focus on that. I won't sell, say celebration, it's not really a celebration. So a regional focus where we'll be um, offering some continuing education. Uh, we'll have um, some guest speakers. We also will do some work days across our local counties. So uh, please take a look on that website for information in your general area. And then EdMaps or I've Got One is a great place to go for more information. The edmaps.org site is a great place for information on all different invasive species, whether that's plants, animals, and of course, inverts in the animal category. And also you can find range maps, some of which Carol was showing you today that show where these species have been found and um, vouchered, meaning they've actually been identified by a professional and we know that they are in that county. Uh, so that's a great place to look there for further education information. And then 
Also, you can report through EdMaps or through the I've Got One app on your mobile device or at the phone number listed on your screen, um, as well as Carol has provided the, the um, I believe it was FDAPS, correct, Carol, the FDAPS phone number uh, for some of these invertebrate pests as well. Uh, one of the best ways to really help this entire situation is to educate yourself and others. So share information. Think about some of the things Carol mentioned today is about some of the ways you can help. Like if you want to have a citrus tree in your yard, only buying from someone who is certified so that you are more assured that you are not becoming part of the problem with citrus greening, for instance. Uh, definitely reach out to your extension office. As we've both mentioned, we are here to help educate the public and to provide a bridge between the public and the university. So if Carol can't identify something or one of us can't identify a plant for you, then that information can go up to UF so that we can get a definitive identification and solution. Uh, the UF IFAS Extension Bookstore has lots of resources and um, identification guides as well. So please feel free to peruse that website, see if there's anything of interest to you there. And um, oh, let me go back for just a second. Also up here, you see EDIS. EDIS stands for Electronic uh, Delivery Information Service or something similar to that, uh, which is basically where you can find every publication about um, or through UF uh, on this website. So as you can see in the graphic here, they have a whole section on invasive species. So lots of more information. Here's your um, invertebrate section here, invasive insects, arachnids, mollusks, and gastropods. So lots more information. This is all science-based research and publications. So it's a great resource for you. All right, so with that being said, we wanna open it up for any questions that you may have. And we want to thank you again for joining us today.